I'd like to officially welcome everybody today to Strength of Community, uh, our chat, and it's about saving the monarch butterfly. My name is Mary Cott, and I am Volunteer Engagement Manager for Front Porch, and I'm, I am uh, located in Glendale, California. So I just want you to know a couple of things. We are recording this event. We've already had a conversation about that. Um, we will be posting this, uploading this to our YouTube channel to share the, the content. So it will be edited and uploaded. So by continuing with this conversation in this chat, you are giving permission to be recorded. So it's always fun to see everybody's faces. Um, we started doing strength of community chats in mid 2020 so that we could check in on everybody, get to know different residents that we hadn't met before to bring staff and residents together and also to practice with our technology, which at the time, a lot of us really didn't use Zoom. So when we get together at Strength of Community, we meet other people, we hear stories, and hopefully we learn some new things. And my favorite thing about Strength of Community is that it reminds me that I'm part of something pretty special. So I want you to know about the Monarch Butterfly Collaborative. It's an informal group that I host on Zoom quarterly, roughly loosely quarterly, and everyone here is welcome. I believe that we share, my goal is always to um, empower people to share good information, to inspire each other, and we, I have a goal in mind. What I'd really like to see is a way to collect um, useful information that can be shared between our communities and between our residents and our staff. And you know what? I believe that that builds community. And that's my favorite part about it. Who doesn't love a butterfly? I know one person who's here today who knows somebody who doesn't like butterflies, but otherwise we do. And you know, this um, collaborative really, we all know the butterfly isn't the end product, it is actually the beginning, the beginning of building community. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm excited to welcome three special featured guests and that um, we had a little change up if you read your flyer. Uh, we are actually going to talk to Sima at Wesley Palms first. Can you and get your phone? I see her here. Sima, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So Sima, uh, you come from Wesley Palms in San Diego. Is that correct? That is correct. And your interest in the monarch butterfly began with a gift of a milkweed plant. Can you tell us the ways that receiving that gift impacted you after the loss of your husband? I can. So my husband. Uh-oh. Well, that's always what happens when people start talking at Wesley Palms. Okay, I think we're going to have to come back to Sima. So, sorry, Mary, you went mute. There you I go. did. Can you let Sima know that she's frozen and that we'll have to pick up her story in a moment? I'd appreciate that in the chat. So I want to show you something that you might be interested in knowing about Front Porch, and that is this. Uh-oh. I can't make it work. One moment. Mm. Okay, so one more time. If you look at the map of Front Porch, you will notice that we're all up and down the coast of California and we're not as far out on the coast as the, you know, it's not to scale, but we have senior living communities that are um, in the Northern and Southern parts of California. Um, and we really sort of mimic the path of the monarch butterfly, their migration, their overwintering. Um, and today, I think you'll learn some things that you can take away that will help you know um, if you are practicing the right things or the right things to look for in creating a habitat. Um, the blue 
are really a lot of our communities and that's affordable housing. And so I know that they've been, our representatives from affordable housing um, have been invited today, but those of you who are part of Covia may not know that we have families with children who live in the Southern California communities. We have three um, communities that have children. And wow, what an opportunity to be able to present this at their communities to build a habitat for children to learn about the monarch butterfly and how to conserve and how to um, build sustainability. So I thought you'd like to know that. Uh, let me ask, and I want to test your knowledge. How well do you know your monarch? So somebody sent me, Nelia from our Walnut Creek office sent this to me, not this photo, but she sent me a beautiful photo of a butterfly. So what type of butterfly is this? This was at the Monarch Preservation up in um, Santa Cruz. So you cannot mute yourself. Can anybody tell me if this is a monarch, viceroy, queen, or a duke? Does anybody know? No. Well, it looks just like a monarch to me, but then I started thinking that doesn't quite look like a monarch, but it was hanging out with the monarchs for very specific reasons. That is a queen. It's a deeper orange. It's got lighter markings than a monarch. Above it is a monarch butterfly. And um, it's got really good camouflage and safety because monarchs are poison. So nobody wants to eat those. And if you hang out, if you're a queen butterfly and you hang out with a monarch, you are safe. And then I have trouble telling a difference between a male and female monarch. Poppy, what is this? Oh, he can't hear me. That's a male. So they have, he has a little tiny dot that I spotted on his wing. I was distracted. <laughs> so that's a male. And um, when you see a butterfly, they're going pretty fast. And everybody that I've ever seen at the communities, um, whenever they see butterflies, oh, look at what a beautiful male. I can't tell the difference because they're going too fast. And then um, Nancy's going to talk, uh, talk to us about native plantings um, later today. And this is really interesting to me. Why do monarchs gather in eucalyptus trees to keep warm or to roost? or because they're there? All of the above. All of the above, because eucalyptus trees are not native to California, even though we have them, love them, enjoy them, and as the monarchs do too. But the monarchs native conifers have been depleted or you know, have gone by the wayside because we really like the eucalyptus and monarchs are very adaptable. So I thought you might enjoy knowing that. Let's see if Sima, is Sima back with us? Yes, I, I don't know what happened. It just uh, cut out. The whole thing just disappeared. It is. It's every time you start talking at Wesley Palms, it freezes. So let's try it again. It's not you. It's just the way it goes. <laughs> so thank you. You'll have to start completely over because we, as soon as you started speaking, it went, it froze. So go ahead and start completely over. Okay. Thank you. So, all right. So my husband, Joe, passed away late last year, and I was devastated. It was a time of grief and isolation. A few weeks after his passing, one of my friends, Naomi, brought over a milkweed plant and told me she was planning to organize a monarch way station right here at Wesley Palms. Soon after, AJ and Barbara brought a butterfly in a box to my back patio. And when I released it, it didn't want to leave my hand. AJ took photos and I was instantly in love. I purchased two safe houses from Amazon and asked one of my neighbors to drive me to obtain milkweed plants. Several residents that became aware of my interest would bring lonely caterpillars for me to put in my safe houses. And each morning when I awoke, I would check to see if they were eating well and also when they became pupas. When they were ready to be released, I would call friends and neighbors to stop by and watch them take flight. When Rosemary's husband passed, AJ and Barbara helped her to organize a safe house in her back patio. And when I would walk my dog, I would stop and see how her caterpillars were doing and how she was doing. I noted that her mood was very much improved, as was mine. 
We had a ribbon cutting ceremony for the newly renovated dog park in June. And the grand finale was for us to walk together over to Rosemary's back patio and release five butterflies. Each butterfly is an expression of new beginnings, new friendships, simple pleasures, a connection between us and nature that inspire joy and wonder. We are helping the butterflies and they sure are helping us in return. Thank you, Sima, so much for telling us your story. And I have a video that AJ sent me of you releasing your little friends who didn't want to go. So let's get that up. And I have so many things going on here, Sima. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. See how this goes. Yes. Did, are you seeing your video? Yes. Okay. And of course. There you go. Oh, this is oh now that's a lovely picture. Oh, you I got love it. it. Yeah. Yeah. It put it oh. up. Oh, my grandchildren. No yes, idea. absolutely. My grandmother, my grandchildren will absolutely say, Granny, Granny, what you, oh, this is so good. I have five grandchildren and one and three quarter great. Okay. Great grand, what? One that's due in April. Yeah. Oh, this is so lovely. <laughs> what a treat. What an absolute treat. You're beautiful. You're absolutely beautiful. Oh. See if you can put it on your plant, maybe. Maybe it'll, any plant, put it doesn't it, matter. Put it down on the plant, yeah. Oh, you don't want to let go, are you? Can you get it? Are you getting that? Do you yeah. see it? Yeah. Okay, shake them off or just push them off or something. He's not going to let go of me. <laughs> he says, I want to stay in with you. <laughs> Get rid of the dog and take me instead. <laughs> Look at that. He's so... Oh, my goodness. There you go. Oh, there it goes. There you <laughs> go. Great. So I do, I, I do want to say that as of March 18th, 1922, we have released 236 monarchs. 236. And is it just from your little safe houses that you right. have? As yes, neighbors? those are just from the little safe houses. And that doesn't include, we have two areas that are heavily planted, uh, which we, we are not able to count. Right. So it's far, far more than that. Those are the wild butterflies. Yes. For those of you who may not know, Wesley Palms, thanks to Sima and her friends, um, they worked with their environmental um, director, director of environmental services to create a habitat. So they are now officially a recognized monarch butterfly habitat. And they have plenty of milkweed and nectar plants and signage. So out in social areas, you have this beautiful Space with butterflies. <laughs> well, good. Well, and today's a perfect day for getting out there. Absolutely. <laughs> so I look forward to seeing you at Wesley Palms again soon and getting the butterfly report, which I always love getting. You work really hard on your butterflies. We do. <laughs> Down at Wesley Palms. We get a lot of reward out of it. I'm so glad. Thank you, Sima. Well, I'm going to turn to Caesar Goldsby of St. Paul's Towers. Are you still with us, Caesar? Good afternoon, everybody. There you are. Well, Caesar, you joined us at one of our collaborative meetings because we did. We featured Wesley Palms in San Diego and their director who uh, and their collaboration to create this habitat. And I saw you feverishly penning notes. It's kind of fun. So. Um, 
Can you tell us why you're interested in creating a monarch habitat at St. Paul's Towers in Oakland and um, how you're accomplishing that? Well, um, I, have, I cannot take credit for all the work that's going into this. I am fortunate to have an ambulance committee and a garden committee, and those residents are extremely helpful and knowledgeable. Um, I like to say about our community that we have enough of a brain trust here that we could run a large state or a small country really well. <laughs> so um, when, uh, <clears throat> when I heard about that, I thought, well, I used to take my son down to Pacific Grove uh, a couple of times a year uh, from the time he was about, you know, backpack size till he drove me the last time we went. Um, and I thought, that's a neat little idea. Uh, I've got a couple of places in my facility that I could turn into uh, something that would might be nice. Uh, I took it to my ambiance committee and they said, oh, we got to have um, the uh, a couple of other people in on this. And before you know it, I had a team. Um, and that's where it started. Um, that coupled with the fact we have an elementary school, you know, 25, less than 25 yards across the street. And I thought, what kid wouldn't like to have a little bit of that? And our residents are, are happy to see us get it done. And the best part about it for a facilities guy like myself is the residents are going to take it over. Uh, they'll manage it for me. Uh, the only thing I have to do is make sure I pay the water bill. So we are um, we're enthusiastic about it, and in coming months we'll show you befores and afters and progress. Just a fun thing to do. You are exactly right. Well, thank you, Caesar. I know that um, Caesar, you've shared that your committee does. What kinds of things do the ambiance committee do? It's pretty amazing. Yeah, so the ambiance committee is um, a group of informed residents that have taste. Let me just say it that way. Um, I, I love to say all my taste is in my mouth. So unless it's chocolate chip cookies or something, don't ask me. But they are very practiced at that. Um, and we narrow down some choices about almost every subject in our in our common areas to something that is uh, workable for St. Paul's and then we take those choices and we review it with those residents. They give us their input. Uh, some of those things that uh, they um, can suggest to us can take us in a much better direction. And every now and then I have to say, well, we're going to have to stick a little closer to the, this plan. But I just don't make a lot of moves in, in the common areas without a little bit of input and sometimes a lot of bit of input from them. They wouldn't trade them for the world. That's wonderful. Um, I hear something like that at most of our communities and I really hope that that is true, that that's true for your experience, any of the residents who are joining us today. And I hope it's also true for any of our colleagues. Um, I think that when Caesar and I first talked, you said something like, you know, I, when I first came here, I was presented with this group and I knew that I needed to make a choice. You could either run from the danger or run toward it. And it was the best decision you ever made to collaborate with those residents. Yeah, that's um, absolutely correct. Um, if you take it all on yourself, then you own it all yourself. Um, I'm smart enough not to always <laughs> want to do that. Um, and then you have people who are have genuinely of goodwill for the community. Uh, how, how do you pass that up? Mm -hmm. um, just not, not going to do it. And like I said, it's paid off for me in, in dividends that you'd never believe. Um, they help with all kinds of things. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Caesar, for sharing with us. I really am inspired by that. And now we are turning our attention to something that is slightly, it's not even off topic, but man, I'm so excited to present 
um, just deepening our understanding about what this all means and, and kind of taking a turn here. Um, I am excited to introduce Nancy and she lives at Canterbury Woods in Pacific Grove, which is Monarch Central as far as I'm concerned. And um, Nancy, can you tell us a little bit about Canterbury Woods and where you live in general, what it's like, and also about you, your passion for native plants and how using them in this endeavor impacts this effort. Let's have you unmute, Nancy. There you go. Can you do it? Using somebody else's equipment, I don't necessarily know where to reach to hit all the buttons. <laughs> I get you. Yeah. Uh, introducing myself, I'm Nancy Frost, and I'm here in a Pacific Grove at Canterbury Woods. And since you've been down here um, looking at the monarchs, you'll know that Pacific Grove, one, is a very, very small community. Um, and within that small community is Canterbury Woods. Pacific Grove likes to call itself the last small town in America, and it is small. It also likes to say that we are the monarch town. And if you ever come down here, if you don't know anything about monarchs, the first sign you're going to see has a monarch on it. The shops have monarchs on it. The corners have monarch stickers on it. Um, we love our monarchs down here, including the kids that do parades at the be beginning of the migration system, uh, system blah, when they're, they're coming here. So welcome to Pacific Grove. And why don't you show a couple of the pictures of, yeah, this is, this is our monarch sanctuary. And you can see they're very tall trees. It's a mixture of pines and eucalyptus. Um, the tall trees give the monarchs the shelter from the wind that they need because we are right on the ocean and it gets very windy here. I was fortunate enough to get down to the grove uh, this year on a very warm day and we have a very large population. I was sitting on a bench and I had monarchs flying all around me, sitting on my shoulders on the, the uh, bench next to me. So it's very special. But I do have to say we at, here at Canterbury Woods um, in our 50 years, 50 plus years, really haven't focused on the monarchs. We're next door neighbors. We're very close to the uh, sanctuary. And I will admit, I am not an expert on monarch butterflies. Uh, my passion is really about native um, ecosystems and particularly um, native plants. So I got asked to do this and I, I went and said, okay, I need to look for some things. What are the plants that the monarchs need here in our community when they're here. And for us, that happens to be winter time. They start arriving around October and they're leaving now. So what are the plants? And what are the, the plants that are native to this area? And what are the plants that we've planted around here? So I have my list. I got it from the Native Plant Society and a couple other sites. And if you're looking for a place to find out what plants are the ones that grow in your area, the California Native Plant Society has wonderful lists for every area. So just being uh, 1.3 miles from the sanctuary here, I knew that there were things that we should and should not do to support the monarchs. Um, milkweed does not naturally occur here. And one of the things I learned was we should never plant milkweed in this area. We're too close mm -hmm. and it changes their migration. Going. <laughs> if okay. uh -oh. okay. 
So armed, armed with Nancy, my list. Nancy, why don't you repeat the previous because you were talked over. Just the last yeah. couple of sentences. So let's see, I'll go back to being just uh, 1.3 miles from the sanctuary here in Pacific Grove. There are things that we should and should not do to support the monarchs. Uh, milkweed does not naturally grow here. So we should never plant any of the milkweed as it will disrupt their natural migration cycle. To support the monarchs, we should be planting plants that bloom during the time that they're here. And for us, that means winter, October through March. We should avoid any use of pesticides, especially any of the broad spectrum types. I've been able to work with a lot of our landscapers and gardeners here, and I know that we use very few pesticides, mainly the one to keep uh, the deer away. I went to the Native Plant Society and pulled out some lists along with some other um, sources on the internet to see what plants would be the ones that would be uh, best for us to be planting here. And I'm always gonna look for what are the native plants that we should be planting. So I was armed with my list and I started out and I was pleased to see that a number of our lo local native plants here on the campus. Um, because they're native, they've evolved to be able to adapt to our areas. We have um, very poor soils here. And so you need something that does not need a rich soil. We're right off the coast. So our weather is variable. It's many times foggy. Um, we are looking for plants that deal with our foggy days, our rainy days, and that's the end of our water. So native plants are adapted to that and they're especially good to be in an area like this. So I took my list and I literally started walking around the campus and looking for things. The primary ones I found, uh, first one was our flowering current. This is a beautiful plant. It's mainly planted in one part of the campus, but it's blooming at the right time of the year. And it, um, I haven't actually seen a monarch on it because I was at the wrong time, but it is one of their favorite plants for around here. The next one I saw, and it's still blooming, is our beautiful Ceanothus wild lilac. We have that in a couple parts of the campus and it's definitely ones that the monarchs like. Those were the, then, then there's the Douglas iris and I need to let you know, this is my very favorite native plant of all types. It's one that blooms anywhere from the coast here up into the high Sierras. And I was very happy to find it is one that the um, monarchs like. And if you look at the one, it's not just monarchs, the little ladybug also likes it. <laughs> so we have some non-natives uh, that also support the monarchs. This is a velvet ground cell. Uh, we just learned the name of it a couple of weeks ago. And one of our residents was able to catch a monarch this year actually on the plant. So that's a good, we definitely know that one. Uh, it supports the navy, the uh, monarchs, excuse me. So one of the, there we go. So another plant, this is also not native, uh, is our salvias and our sages. Now you can see over here on the left side, part of our deer population. This is a major problem for us in anything we plant and including uh, plants that we would do for the monarchs because they like the flowers, they like the plants, and if they're blooming at times when others aren't, they're out there eating them. But this one um, is a great one. You can see one of our handsome bucks here looking through the plants. Um, and it is one that the monarchs like and the deer don't eat. And are we talking about this bright red one on the side? That bright red one on the side, there's a little bit of red in the back there. And we have a lot of that planted in different spots around the campus. And that's a yucky one for the deer. 
and the deer do not eat this. Okay. Oops. You can see this handsome guy looking at me through the uh, salvia. The other thing with the salvia, uh, also called sages, is it supports the hummingbirds. So here we're in the process of redoing one of our landscapes. On the left, we planted a new Ceanothus plant. The next morning, less than 24 hours, probably less than 12 hours, the deer had eaten all the flowers off. So it's a challenge. Fortunately, in this case, the deer pruning this plant will not kill the plant. So some of the challenges in finding the right plants one of the plants that supports um, monarchs is yarrow. And here are two different yarrow plants. They bloom at different times of the year. So if you're choosing a yarrow plant as one of yours, you need to find the plant that will bloom in your area when you expect to find monarchs there. And this is one of the very showy plants that's planted very, all along the uh, coastal area. Unfortunately, we've had a couple of plants here at Canterbury Woods. I say unfortunately because it is loved by the monarchs, it's loved by bees, it's loved by birds, but California has now deemed this as an invasive plant. So one of the problems of planting something like this is it will eventually take over all the native plants which support other insects uh, and limits the whole spectrum of what you're going to find in an area. So in summary, if you're going to try to plant for the, the monarchs, one of the things you wanna do is choose very wisely what plants are right for your area what plants will bloom at the time when your monarchs are there. And if you do that, you're gonna land up with a beautiful garden supporting the monarchs and probably other wildlife as well. Thank you, Nancy. This, this is new information. So does anybody have questions? We'll go back to Caesar and Sima, but does anybody have questions about this? Because this is very different. You can unmute yourself and ask. I think everybody is satisfied. No, What's really, I have, I oh, have, Anne has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, Nancy, you and I have talked about this, but I'm wondering if you were able to get some up-to-date information in regards to um, the fact that when there's wintering sites for monarchs that milkweed should not be planted within a certain radius of those wintering sites because it interrupts the, um, the growth cycle. Was, was that an urban myth that, that you and I talked about and you debunked or is that still something that we need to take into consideration? Uh, not an urban myth. It is a very definite since we are so close to a sanctuary, when I found Anne, Anne is the one that took the picture of the monarch on that plant, by the way, um, is we should not have any milkweed planted five to 10 miles away from our site. Now down, I found from Mary that down in Southern California, um, depending on whether you're north or south of Santa Barbara, you may have only one mile away, or you may have as much as five miles. So you have to kind, you have to find out uh, for your particular area what is the right thing to do. And the other thing is, if you're planting milkweed, there's non-native milkweed out there, and there's native milkweed. The best thing to do is always plant the native milkweed. Yeah, and we've had that conversation too. I know that Nancy and I, um, yeah, so just rule of thumb, um, what she's talking about is if you're at Santa Barbara or North, then you would um, wanna be five miles inland. And if you're Santa Barbara or South, you'd wanna be at least one mile inland. So we have two coastal communities. And then I did a cursory map, just so you know, I looked around and everybody was just inside that five miles. 
in the north for the most part. I, I just took like a Caesar in Oakland. You were inside. <laughs> you were in the safety <laughs> zone. <laughs> and um, I'm like, oh, that could really ruin this chat. But um, like everybody was pretty much in the safety zone. Carlsbad by the sea does have a butterfly garden, but that would mean that they would want to focus on ne nectar plants. I know that at one point when the, um, the population was plummeting, everybody was purchasing whatever kind of milkweed they could. And so um, part of this collaborative has helped us to figure out how to work with that milkweed to you know, safely not introduce illness into the population, what that means for us, growing things from seed, like Hoppy's here. Um, he's been doing growing from seed, Walnut Village has been growing from seed. So it's just kind of interesting how everybody is um, approaching solutions. Um, I had a question about this growing from seed. Could you explain that for us, please? I think Hoppy could answer that. Hoppy, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. He grows from seed. So just, yeah, you plant a seed and you grow it, right, Hoppy? <laughs> yeah, I get uh, I get the narrow leaf milkweed seeds. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them that I buy, I really have trouble getting to sprout. You know, you can buy a uh, hundred seeds online and, and who knows what they did to them, but not one will sprout. And I buy another batch and they, I get some that sprout so it's really inconsistent just getting them to germinate but uh i once i get them to germinate um i just uh, i plant them and uh down here in san diego the the narrow leaf dies back to the ground every year it's just gone but then it, it they grow from root tubers in the spring and right now i've got a, a, a lot of my narrow leaf is growing from from root tubers right now it's just it just pops up right out of the ground out of nowhere you didn't even know there was a plant there uh it dies back that 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 severely in the winter here um but uh yeah you just uh, just plant a bunch of seeds and some of them will sprout uh, you know and and then uh, I do, I, I, I transplant them. They're, they're weed, they're really hard to kill. You know, I, I transplant the same the native plant about three or four times sometimes. In fact, especially when I first started here at the garden, I, I, they forced me to move my garden a couple of times. Just dig it all up, transplant it. You know, it's, it's very easy to grow. But the hardest part of it is to I had, um... I ordered some uh, seeds from um, Pleasant Grove and they sent me up a couple small packages and I thought I was going to augment that by putting in some just going to Home Depot because I don't know any better. Going to Home Depot, grabbing a few things and putting it in there and then let the native or let the seeds come up during the next growing season. But I, I, I was wondering if I was hearing that we should not be purchasing the plants to put in there to sort of augment the site until the native plants took over. Home Depot is not known for really carrying a lot of local native plants for their area. One of the things, if you're looking for the plants, uh, you're up there in Oakland. I know that there's very active chapters of the Native Plant Society. And this time of year, almost all the societies up and down the, the coast inland, the Native Plant Societies have plant sales. And they're an excellent place to get good quality native plants and excellent information about the individual plants and how to take care of them. These are groups of individuals that are passionate about the plants. They will be so happy to talk to you about the right ones. That is a great tip. That's a great oh, tip. Yeah. By the way, I, I grow them in pots a lot of times. Most of them I grow in pots. That way, if I have to move them again, you know, I, I don't have to dig them up and transplant them. They grow pretty good in pots. Uh, if 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 you got them in a uh, in a uh, maybe in a in a five gallon pot, they'll do really good. Uh, they'll get a little a little root bound in a one gallon pot. But if you have some five gallon pots around, just put them in a pot. And if you have to move them, you can move them. And like I say, they die back to the ground level every winter. Never even know there's a plant there. And then all of a sudden in February, March, you'll start seeing little sprouts coming up out of the ground. And by the by the end of summer, they're probably about two, three foot tall. 
What and time did the monarchs, uh, what time of the year are the monarchs in your area? They're here all the time. Um, we're, we're, we're an overwintering site, but it's so warm in the winter, they, they, you know, they, they, they come out of the trees at midday, you know, I mean, they're, um, San Diego is pretty warm. <laughs> That's all I can say. Um, we're, we're, they, some of the people just call it a, a year round uh, pop, native population in here. We get more in the, in the, in the summer, obviously, because they're, they're, they're much more active. They, they, even though they're, they're a little active here in the winter, um, because on the warm days, on the cold days, they just disappear. You don't see them. They, I don't know if they just stay in the trees or what, but uh, they, they don't function real well below 65 degrees. And no, neither do we in yeah. Southern California. <laughs> so just so you know, like, yeah, 60, 60, 65 is mountain weather down here. And um, we're generally mild. So that's really the, the, um, the challenge of microclimates in California. I want to say we have 23 or 33. I mean, we have a, a very big number of microclimates. So you can, that's why we always carry a jacket. And um, the monarchs will be doing different things throughout the year. And we have essentially two springs here, a spring and a fall growing season. So we, you know, we, we just don't, stuff doesn't stop growing. You have to clip it back just because they make you. <laughs> and your milkweed will die back eventually. Um, Caesar, I hope that answered your question. I think that it's going to, that's exciting to imagine uh, a native plant sale up in your area. That sounds really cool. Nectar plants. I will ask someone in that ambiance committee to track that down for me so I'll know what I'm buying and where. Totally. And those are good plants too because they've, they've stood the test of time. They've been propagated out from something else. Um, thank you, Nancy, for that tip. So do we? And I know there's a very active Native Plant Society in the Oakland area. I used to live in Oakland. They usually have their plant sales uh, at one of the colleges. We have very polite people with their um, hands raised. Carolyn, do you have a question? <laughs> oh, we're still muted, Carolyn. Oh, it, because you'd asked me to unmute, my own unmute button wasn't working. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Still on a learning curve. <laughs> we all are. We all are. Um, I'm a little concerned that um, I've heard five to 10 miles for the milkweed. And I just want to express that. Mm -hmm. um, and disrupting their cycle um, kind of breaks my heart. Um, the other question I have is that I have heard that if you don't plant enough milkweed, that that is a problem, that one caterpillar can, can eat one whole milkweed. And if you don't have enough of them, if the butterflies are attracted and they deposit a lot of caterpillars, uh, th most of them end up starving to death. And I'm just wondering if people are um, addressing that concern. Yeah, Sima, are you still here? I am. <laughs> do you? I don't know if you were active with your group. Do you remember what happened when they, and Hoppy had this experience too. Um, I know Barbara and AJ were really active when you, before you had your garden built. Do you remember that? They, they were making milkweed runs, weren't they? Do you remember that? It, yeah, I call it milkweed shock. <laughs> you know, a, a lot of people will go out and they'll plant a couple plants. And then uh, my first, I, I planted two plants, you know, because somebody told me to plant milkweed. I didn't know anything about it. I planted two plants and uh, my, the caterpillars totally wiped them out. So then the next thing, you know, I'm running down trying to find milkweed. But uh, now I, I, we grow a minimum of seven plants, uh, you know, or seven pots with who knows how many, you know, four or five plants per pot. And uh, it, uh, uh, they haven't uh, wiped me out in the last two years. Um, I, I have a big problem here with uh, with uh, uh, my outdoor plants with uh, wasps. Uh, wasps annihilate uh, caterpillar communities, and right now I, I don't have a very good survival rate because the wasps are killing everything. Um, I've got some pretty gross pictures of, of wasps flying flying off with uh, 
uh, monarch caterpillars in their grass. Um, they have predators. And right now uh, where I'm at, there's just been a lot of wasp nests around here. So the, the, it's, these days um, uh, I do get a pretty good survival rate, but uh, it, uh, it really gets hit hard by the wasps. Yeah. And they're not wiping out my milkweed. In fact, uh, you know, the wasps are just flying around all day here. AJ is the one at Wesley Paul's that uh, he does uh, from seeds. He does plant from seeds. And uh, is, is Barbara here? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. She might be off at the whale watching event. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. Uh, but it's AJ that, that knows how to, uh, to start with the seeds. And, uh, and, and Barbara and AJ are the ones that really um, you know, I, I'm, I'm just learning, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I, I, I'm very um, emotionally attached to these butterflies. And I love, I would love to sit, you know, it's the last two years that we've been pretty much closed down and I can sit on my window and look out and while I'm having dinner alone, I can look out and I, I can notice the butterflies and I put on some classical music. And it's, you know, it's, it's meant a lot to me, particularly in the last year. Thank you, Sima. Yeah, and it really has, it's, it's kept people busy. You've learned new things and yeah. I just appreciate you, um, you sharing. And made new friends, made new yeah. friends as well. Definitely. Grace, I hope that helped Carolyn. Um, but I do know that everybody's region is different. So that's really one of the, you know, when we come across controversy or things that we've heard, different things that we've heard on the internet read, um, we ferret that out and we work together. And I think that's the strength of, of doing this together so that we can really float the best information we're finding um, to each other and support each other. Grace, you had a question. No, I don't have a question. Or I comment. was gonna just say something. <laughs> a few years ago on the central coast, I went to the Monarchs where they were staying and I bought a pamphlet. And for San Diego County, there are three small communities one at UCSD, the Eucalyptus Grove, one in Carlsbad, which I now, right now I can't recall the name of it, and also Presidio Park. And so that year I went and visited all three areas and the one in Carlsbad had the most monarchs and then the, the uh, Presidio Park had the least. So UCSD was in the middle and San Diego has a, very active native plant society and they meet in Balboa Park and they have plant sales and also you can get native plants at Southwestern Community College they have a garden there um Hoppy can you remember what it's called it's really for uh arid gardening uh, but uh so it's an interesting place to visit in uh San Diego County. Thank you. Well, I just took a couple notes. I don't have any links, but that's very helpful. We have a lot of communities down in San Diego, that um, county. And I know that our residents really, just so you, I, I don't know that anybody down south is any different from up north, but I know that our life enrichment directors really want this guidance as far as where we, where we can go as residents um, to visit different interesting and um, places that we haven't been before. So um, I hope that our life enrichment directors down south will keep that in mind. Well, I still have the pamphlet on the bookshelf somewhere. I have a oh. lot of bookshelves. <laughs> so I could give it to Heather. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. And Grace is coming to us from Frederica Manor. Um, Anita Dyer, you have your hand raised as well. And well, tell us more than two. I'm sorry, I'm from Canterbury Woods. Thank you. And I wanted to um, add a comment about native plant sales. It's like they are certainly not the least expensive plants you will find, but they're always very high quality. And you get that support of being able to chat with the volunteers when you're sh walking around looking at the plants and doing your shopping and get a good deal of high quality advice. So it's one of those you get what you pay for deals. Um, but I wanted to clarify, I don't quite understand it. The impression I'm getting is that you don't plant milkweed if your butterfly sanctuary or butterfly people, butterflies 
are not reproducing in your area, if this is their overwintering or seasonal, this is not where they reproduce and lay their eggs. This is where they overwinter and then they go someplace else to reproduce and lay their eggs, which is what our butterflies do. Um, so I'm, I'm getting the impression you plant milkweed if it's a reproduction area and you plant nectar plants if it's an overwintering area and they just need to survive to get through their next migration. Am I understanding that correctly? What do you say, Nancy? I think that's correct because I am having the same question. Where do the butterflies do what? Because I know that down south, we do have to have nectar plants as well because they need to eat a snack and then get flying off north. You know, you said early on, Mary, that we have so many eco climates here in uh, California. And so you really have to look at your particular area and see what happens in your particular area. Um, the, the, it's, it's Santa Cruz is actually more restrictive on milkweed than Pacific Grove. They also have a very large overwintering area for the monarchs. We want our monarchs to go on, well, the monarchs down south migrate differently than the monarchs up here in the north. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping our monarchs are heading east to pollinate all the plants in the Salinas Valley, and then they start heading north. Yours are heading south. And so you're, you have to look at it for your particular area. Um, because I'm not an expert on monarchs, I've been learning this very quickly. There are a lot of very good sites. And I'm guessing also when I've suggested the native plant societies, they probably know a lot about uh, where you should and shouldn't plant the um, milkweed in your particular area or what plants are the right ones to plant. It's pretty hard to be passionate about native plants and not know what they're supporting. That is a good rule. Of, that's, that's really a good standard. So um, I hope that we'll all be able to explore. And you know, this, this starts out simple. You think, oh, that's a pretty flower. <laughs> it ends up like, oh, that's not so simple anymore, is it? Oh, it's a butterfly. Oh, it's not so simple, is it? But um, this is fascinating. This is amazing. Thank you. This is, I've learned so much already. You think that there's no more to, well, I'm not an expert, so there's plenty to learn. Um, does anybody have, we're almost coming up against the hour. Does anybody have any questions before I tell you what's next? Any final questions for our guests? No question, but if you lose me, it's because uh, my battery went dead. Okay. Well, I will miss you if I lose you, Hoppy. Um, <laughs> Well, thank you all for joining us and giving us input and sharing with us the ways that um, monarch butterflies and having a monarch butterfly habitat can really influence your community. Um, I love that Nancy, I invited Nancy uh, Frost because she sort of widens our conversation because we are interested in sustainability at our communities. We are interested in doing the right things at our communities. And often we don't know that, um, or we have never, considered native plants. And I think that that's really important. So if nothing else, um, not nothing else, but it, one of the components of this conversation is really um, considering how we can bring balance to our communities that is sustainable um, and, and how we can build community that way. So I have two things I wanna tell you. We're actually getting together as a Monarch Collaborative. I've set a date for Monday, July 18th, and we're going to visit um, via Zoom, and we're going to talk about Walnut Village in Anaheim. And really they have a goal of education to their native, to their native, to their neighborhood school. Um, so I look forward to seeing anybody who would like to join us there. And then also Jen Sabaut, are you here with us? I haven't seen your face. I don't know that Jen is with us, but I do want to, you to know that we will host another Strength of Community chat in May, and it is about um, aging. And I think that many of us might have received um, that information, but 
uh, Jen is going to be hosting that in May. So I hope you will all join us and I thank you for your time. Are there any other questions or comments or anything that you wanna share with us before we go? Uh, for the Canterbury Woods folks, we've never <laughs> focused on monarchs. I'm going to give you a little head start. We always do a pretty active Earth Week activity here. Don't be surprised if monarchs don't appear in some of the questions and activities this year. <laughs> <laughs> you take your monarchs for granted, Nancy. Just kidding. You have yes. a lot of beautiful. You have a lot of beautiful nature up there, as do all of our communities. You have. We have some of the most beautiful communities. Um, that you can find anywhere. So I hope that you will be curious and that you will explore this topic and that you will get involved at your own living community to um, see how, like I said, see what kind of little impact we can make towards sustainability, towards um, building community through um, taking care of each other. So I thank you all of my featured guests. I really appreciate your time, the time and effort that you put into today. And I hope you all have a wonderful week end and I will see you again soon. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> and Michelle, I see Katie down here. Yes. We, we said hi to one another. <laughs> we were talking Katie. about you before, Katie. <laughs> Katie, Michelle's BFF. Thanks, Caesar. Good to see you, Katie. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Sima. Thank you. Good to see you all. Bye.